very quickly about me and then I'll let everyone give their two or three bullet points max. Um, I'm a professor at NYU. Um, that's the top line moniker here where I teach a number of courses as it relates to this specifically. Um, I teach a course about the intersection of, of gaming and Web3 um, at NYU. Uh, I'm also an attorney. Like, you know, we don't have enough lawyers in this room, so we apparently needed to add another. Um, and I, a lot of my practice centers around crypto. So I've been involved with a lot of big NFT projects. I've been a founder several times over, which is a topic for another day. Um, but I'll kick it around the room and let's 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 do the guys in person because I had the opportunity to speak to you um, and give your two, three bullet points quick. Ram, I know you said I shouldn't do this, but I'm trying to do be as diplomatic as possible. Sure, I'll, I'll be brief. Hi, Ram Alawalia. Pleasure to reconnect and meet many of you. Uh, I lead uh, Lumida Wealth or private wealth focused on digital assets. We're fintech operators. I heard Crossover Bank mentioned the prior panel is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I was the operating executive at Crossover building a crypto business where our clients were Coinbase and Stripe and so forth. And Crossover had acquired my prior business, Pure IQ, which was one of the kind of Bloomberg terminals uh, for the category. It's uh, my intro. Go for it. Thank you, Ram. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, Daniel, uh, I'm uh, now a professor, an adjunct professor of law at uh, FIU School of Law. Uh, since January of 2020, I've been teaching first blockchain regulation and law, and now also fintech law. In the last two years, I just gave my students a final essay exam the other day to send out and figure out what they wanted uh, to ask them you know, questions. Uh, I will give a plug for FIU compared to UM, just so you know that FIU also is pretty active in the uh, uh, blockchain space uh, and fintech space. Uh, it recently affiliated with blockchain.com, which also has moved its headquarters down to Miami. Actually, they're in, the, in, the, in Wynwood section, uh, a centralized exchange. Uh, prior to uh, uh, teaching at FIU, uh, and also acting as an advisor and a columnist for Cointelegraph. I was a leader of the securities litigation and SEC enforcement defense practice at Baker Hostetler, which is one of the top 15 law firms in the country. And uh, I also then ran its hedge fund industry practice, as Marty noted. So uh, I'm glad to be here and to talk uh, on this panel. Thank you. So why don't we go Aaron, Robert, Pat, in just a random, no particular order that I just selected. Aaron, go ahead. Hi, uh, Aaron Zerker, um, the CEO and uh, operator of Coinado.com. Um, we were formerly a cryptocurrency uh, trading and arbitrage high-frequency trading firm. Um, we made a pivot around three or four years ago to analytics and advising. Uh, so we run a, a large... Uh, Data set, uh, data set of cryptocurrency exchange data, do analysis on it for uh, some of our uh, bespoke clients, and as well as uh, we've advised uh, various uh, legislature, um, as well as um, uh, just general advising for the industry. Thank you. Robert. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm in California at the moment. Uh, and uh, I'm Robert Levin. I have a fund called Emerging Star Digital DeFi Fund in Wyoming. And we were <laughs> focused on tokens last year and this year we pivoted to NFT platforms and global macro. Uh, so my background is 50% on Wall Street and working for hedge funds and uh, yeah. Paul Tudor Jones, Lewis Bacon and also uh, Solomon Brothers and my family's firm in Wall Street when it was a uh, large global commodities firm. And then I uh, got into technology in artificial intelligence and uh, worked in mobile uh, development of applications and um, became a tech pioneer of the World Economic Forum and been going to side events uh, since the World Economic Forum for over 10 years. So uh, my focus now is NFT platforms and uh, searching for deals that are illiquid that will go uh, public in the next six, 12 months. And I guess, Pat, that leaves you. Great. Thank you. Um, good. Hi, everyone. Again, uh, apologies. I'm not there, but you have four better people down there from our shop at Oasis Pro. You have Bob Yospiel, 
and uh, Wes Jameson, Jonathan Booz, and Thomas Rubio. So I'm sure you've met them at the uh, dinner or other functions down there. Um, but again, apologies, I'm up here in the New York area in Connecticut to be specific. My background, 25 plus years, Wall Street. Uh, I ran private equity placements globally at both Bear Stearns and at Credit Suisse. I uh, also was running capital markets for First Horizon and um, had the opportunity about, I, I've been an operator. I, I have a merchant banking background as well after, uh, after my stint with the large firms and uh, got into crypto about four years ago with one of the largest DeFi players uh, called MakerDAO. Uh, I'm a Maker OG, so I'm like an original and uh, was there two and a half years as I was incubating Oasis Pro. And we, what we are is an infrastructure and uh, investment bank. And we're unique on the uh, infrastructure and, and, um, and uh, services side because we have what's called an ATS and alternative trading system for digital securities. Uh, we're currently the only ATS that can actually do a, what's called an atomic swap, a simultaneous exchange of digital cash, stable coins, um, which are well known now, CBDCs, when they become effective, Bitcoin and ETH for digital securities. And we're, we're approved for a whole host of different security types from funds to structured products to equities to over-the-counter ADRs, et cetera. And our focus is really institutional. Our focus is large deals. Uh, just the other day, uh, we, were, we uh, advised on a $200 million uh, DeFi deal uh, in the, in the, um, with MakerDAO or with uh, one of our investors, Redwood Trust. And the idea is eventually to tokenize that and put that on our ATS with major institutions. So, um, and we've got another billion or so in the pipeline along those lines. So good to be here. So I guess the biggest issue guys is that there hasn't been any big news in the last month in the crypto world. So I assume we have nothing to talk about here. Um, and not enough people to talk about it with. Um, I told everyone before this started that, that this whole panel is going to be about largely FTX. So why don't we start from the president work backwards? So BlockFi just filed for Chapter 11 in New Jersey. And it seems like this is, uh, it seems like things are unraveling very, very quickly. Um, so a very broad question for the room here, and I and I, and I got to direct this because there, again, there, we get five people on this panel. Um, is is where do we go from here with respect to the Web three and crypto space? Um, and I think I the best place to start is with the bankruptcy lawyer because this is uh this is where you you know your your bailiwick is, and you've probably seen a lot of work. I don't know if you guys are still on Twitter after Elon took it over, but Aaron Levy from Box joked yesterday on Twitter. He said. Seems like the only people making money off crypto are uh, bankruptcy attorneys. So I might as well start there with you, Mark, um, and say and ask where do we go from here in the wake of FTX? Um, okay, so I'll put on my uh, take it. sure. Thanks. I'll put it first on my legal hat on before I talk prefatorial because I want to talk about disintermediation, which I think is a very interesting topic. Okay, but uh, as a formerly at Baker Hostel, the, uh, my partner Irvin Picard, uh, we were responsible for trying to uh, unravel what occurred there and then uh, figure out who the victims were and then trying to get back money, as much money as possible. You heard, for those that were here an hour and a half ago, you heard that uh, we've recovered about 14 billion so far of about the 18 or 20 billion that's there. I, uh, I also made a comment that even though originally I thought it was 60 billion, uh, it turned out it was close to be 20 billion. I think we're gonna find the same thing here with FTX. People think it's 8 billion. When all the Clarence done, if, if Pasanelli and other firms, which I think is very, by the way, a great firm, uh, they do a great uh, blockchain um, uh, uh, weekly publication. You guys should sign up for my firm. My former firm does one as well, but I, I think very highly of that firm being both in the fintech space and the blockchain space. Uh, if they follow the same playbook that that we created, because there was no, respectfully, there was no playbook before this situation, the Madoff of how you go about doing this. Bankruptcy is pretty much a sleepy little uh, uh, a sleepy little area of the law. Everything was settled. There was never a lot of litigation. We brought a thousand lawsuits. We had to develop theories of liability and who to go after. We ended up doing that. We went after financial institutions. We went after our people in clawbacks. Clawbacks, very briefly, to be more specific on a legal basis. In bankruptcy code cases, uh, the trustee or the, the 
debtor is able to claw back from the insiders any transfers, any transfers in the last 90 days prior to the bankruptcy, any. For, and that's for any insiders. For anyone else in the world, excuse me, go back a year, go back a year for insiders. You can go back 90 days for everybody else in the world. Anyone in the world that took withdrawals out before the bankruptcy that, oh, oh damn, my friend got his money out on his crypto out, I didn't. He's not keeping that money or she's not keeping that money. It's absolutely gonna go back into the estate, okay? Anything within the last, anything within the last 90 days. Separate and apart is you have these fraudulent conveyance claims, okay? And those fraudulent conveyance claims go back two full years. So if there's no value or full value given for any of transactions of money that left out, any of the entities at FTX, that's also coming back. Third source of breach fiduciary duty claims, I mentioned we collected back a quarter billion dollars from Chase for them being a banker. You're gonna, they're gonna go after the auditors, right? For the uh, some of the entities which they audited, even if they're gonna claim they're done there, you know, we put all the disclaimers in there, they're gonna get sued. Every policy, you know, the ones that are gonna end up paying up here are the various policies. So I'm not, I, it's not like, it's not a bad thing that's occurred here, but I don't think it, you know, it's the end of the world. I think it's a one-off, not, I shouldn't say one-off, but I should say it's just bad people acting badly and, uh, uh, and slipping into wrongful activity, which is what I think generally kind of people I used to represent <laughs> when I was over at Baker before I, you know, before I started getting involved and being one of, of the core team of the uh, Madoff case. So, I mean, that's the inside baseball bankruptcy lens of this, right? Like there's so many, there's so many perspectives with respect to FTX. Um, I'll kick it to you, Ram. It's, it's where did, where did everybody go wrong with FTX and Sam Bankman fried Was it, was it a regulatory failure, which obviously there's no, there's no regulatory really framework for this right now. Um, was it a lack of diligence? Was it an overheated market? You know, any, any way you want to take this is, is I'm happy to let I you think, take I think you, you nailed up several of the factors, but zooming out, this is broader than FTX. Look at the demise of Celsius of Three Arrows Capital. The theme at work here is you have non-banks acting like banks. What does that mean? You have a non-bank that's borrowing short-term liquid deposits and then lending against long-term liquid assets that don't have a marketable securities market. And that pattern always ends in disaster. We saw this in FinTech lending 2015. That was my prior industry and Pete and I were in that category. It happens every eight to 10 years. You saw in specialty finance as well. So that's the broader theme. So what's the response? I think there are two responses. One is there's a push for decentralization across the entire stack, including the DAP layer, not just the protocol layer. That's one. Uh, I think the other theme is the push for web 2.5. And what does that mean? You know, There's a role for trusted institutions. Trust still matters in a trustless world. What are the most trusted institutions in the world today, there are banks, there are clearinghouses, there are ATS systems because they're regulated. FTX Global was an international exchange that had less supervision. So I think what we're gonna to start to see is banks will be the beneficiary of this because banks have distribution to the clients. Banks are subject to KYC and AML. Banks can rehypothecate legally. Banks do have short-term deposits and they're insured buy a lender of last resort, and they have member FDIC. So that's going to be the next leg in the next few years, Web 2.5. Got it. Um, let me let me, let me me kick it to you, Pat. I mean, I know I know your bailiwick is, is the regulatory piece. Um, you know, it's funny. I started, do, I started doing these or sort of moderating this panel in earnest in March at South by Southwest. And if you went to South by Southwest, you couldn't go five minutes without hearing someone pitch something that had blockchain shoehorned into it. Um, and you realize like when you get to a point and I'm like very, very brief, very, very brief editorial wind up. I mean, there's, there's certain things that make you realize that we've jumped the shark in an industry and it's gotten too hot. And when you have FTX, Coinbase, et cetera, all paying for Super Bowl spots and Tom Brady, and I don't know if there's any other New York Jets fans there. If you're paying fireman Ed, and if you even know who that guy is to be in a, to be in a commercial spot, I think we've jumped the shark as an industry. Um, so we all felt the tipping point was coming, but what do you think regulation looks like? Because it feels like we're playing a game of whack-a-mole right now. Yeah, um, yeah, great question. I, uh, you know, as we look in, as I look into the crystal ball, you know, I'm, we're we're tra we're mostly tradfi here. Most of my background is tradfi, even though I was I have been deep in DeFi for a few years, and um, and I think that you know all this really started with Terra Luna. I don't know if people remember that, but that brought down three arrows and 
what we're seeing now is still the contagion from that. And I think it's gonna continue into next year. So um, not to be negative on this industry because I've been in it, I'm a believer in at least Bitcoin and ETH. NFTs, I'm still getting my arms around. I'm really, I, I'm excited about it, but just from a valuation standpoint, you know, still getting my arms around that. And um, we're infrastructure, right? And regulation, we're heavily regulated, right? So, um, you know, to Ron's uh, earlier comments, I do think the banks like us and others are going to benefit from this because we're very heavily regulated. Uh, we work with credible parties. And at the end of the day, that's what it, that's where um, institutions will gravitate for, uh, gravitate to, which means that's where eventually accredited and retail investors will gravitate to. So I view this um, the next 12 to 18 months. This is definitely a setback. Um, for the industry. It could be some have claimed two, three years for crypto. I, I firmly believe that because we're aware of some other companies filing for bankruptcy right now that haven't hit the public uh, or in process to uh, file for bankruptcy. It's a very difficult environment to raise capital in this space right now, meaning crypto. Um, it's um, And I, I honestly, I, I just think that's going to continue. So if I were asked, you know, where should I invest? I, you know, and I've been pretty consistent on this for a couple of years. I would just point to Bitcoin and ETH because they both, they're very different and <clears throat> they have, um, you know, different uh, benefits, but I do believe in the long term they're going to be there and they won't get regulated out. And some of the regulators have, um, have suggested that as well. From a regulatory standpoint, I think the earlier panel mentioned this, you know, I, you know, I've been in um, I've been in uh, banking securities most of my career. I've never seen the regulators go light in any in industry. Now, the downside of that is that blockchain has huge amount of benefits that the current regulations, 30, um, you know, the 30 Act, 34, 33 Act, et cetera, uh, don't contemplate. And um, so right now we're working with <clears throat> um you know, a round ball and square holes, but we have to play that. Uh, there's no, there's no uh, other choice if you want to be in a regulated market. So we're going down that path with the vision that eventually, and, and, and this is the big thing, at least in the US about blockchain, just so, you know, the audience is aware of this. The regulators don't view the blockchain as a trusted source or a good, what's called a good control location. So, they look at a transfer agent or the issuer to be that. Now that's a very vital issue. So even though it's immutable, the blockchain is immutable, the blockchain itself, you know, that protocol hasn't been hacked in, you know, in 14 years or um, in the case of at least Bitcoin and ETH a, a lesser time, it's never been hacked, but they do not view that as a good control location. When they do, and they will, but it may be five years out, it may be a little less, um, and we're trying our best to get it moving, <clears throat> but the legis they're looking at legislation as well, which, as we know here in the U.S., is going to be very difficult with the upcoming Congress, and, you know, the split government. But until the blockchain is, view is viewed as a good control location, we're still going to be stuck with these old laws and uh, 33 and 34 Act. Now, as soon as that happens, you don't need a transfer agent. You already don't need a clearing firm in regards to what we do, which is pretty exciting. A custodian acts as a clearing firm. And, um, and you have the immutable record of the blockchain, which brings about perfect data, lower costs, increased safety, faster payment. So in five to 10 years, this will be ubiquitous in the capital markets. But I, I would say the next couple of years, it's going to be more of the same. And uh, it's going to be um, rulemaking by enforcement. And uh, that's just going to continue. I, 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 you know, I wish I could have better news on that, but that, you know, from our perspective is what we're going to see. And this FTX debacle, and obviously now with uh, BlockFi, et cetera, it just just hardens that view. Yeah, there's going to be a few people going to jail. Um, that that that's that's my that's my short take. Uh, I, but you gave me you gave me you gave me a good you gave me a good segue. Um, for Aaron, Aaron, I know you started your career trading in this in this industry. Um, I think most people are wondering where do you put your money now. Um, uh, yeah, so 
this in just this last couple months have given me flashbacks to around 2013-2014 when Mount, Mount Gox crashed. Um, I, I was able to guide quite a few people through that scenario um, at both having cryptocurrency on Mount Gox and kind of warning about the liquidity situation beforehand. Um, I think this will play out very similarly. We're going to most likely have a year or possibly more of a continued winter, which we've already been, I believe, in for a long time. Um, the transactions on chain uh, have been very similar to the time period surrounding Mt. Gox. Uh, we're looking at the thousand Bitcoin holders uh, and plus decreasing their uh, asset uh, allocations towards cryptocurrency um, in a very rapid fashion. Um, we're also looking at the everything below that, the 1,000 to uh, the one to 1,000 Bitcoin cohorts uh, increase. So you're having an absorption of this uh, of this larger holdings, uh, institutional holdings being distributed. We're in a very hard distribution phase. Uh, but the good news is that the actual distribution is being picked up, even though the price is dropping. Um, that being said, we are looking at very large weakness in older coins. So during these capitulation events, we look for the amount of older coins, let's say six months to five years of holding that are in now in circulation that weren't before. Uh, so we're looking at over 4% now uh, from this FTX and climbing. Uh, those are similar numbers to Mt. Gox uh, capitulation, the 2019 capitulations and the 2020 uh, COVID crash. These are all indica indicative of possibly a localized slash max pain bottom, but this is cryptocurrency and it could always go further. This could just be the local of the further bottom, uh, obviously. So the general sense here is if you are a large institution, you're hedging. Uh, if you're a smaller entity, you see this as an attractive time to possibly hold for five years plus. Um, it's, it's the larger and uh, less nimble institutions that really have to say, okay, we have this large block now that may be illiquid very quickly uh, in six months and we won't be able to hold through it. Um, so in terms of trading, I, I do agree with uh, Pat's uh, sentiment about holding Ethereum and Bitcoin for the longer term that they most likely won't be hit by regulation in the sense that a lot of these other currencies that could be subjected to securities are. Um, but I don't believe that we're going to be seeing a major uptick in uh, price in the next six, seven months without global macro being getting better, without some form of regulation on centralized uh, cryptocurrency, which is uh, present in the United States, but because of regulatory arbitrage, almost all the transactions for for cryptocurrency are taking place outside of the United States to places like FTX and places like that require much less uh, regulatory um, environment. Uh, that has created a shift towards DeFi, but at the same time, we've had almost two billion dollars in DeFi hacks this year. So people are kind of sitting there saying. Would I rather be fractionally reserved by a, by a, a CFI, or would I rather be hacked out of DeFi? And it's quite a conundrum for people who are wanting to speculate on the industry. My best hope for this is that DeFi protocols become stronger, become more audited, uh, become more mainstream, which will create more auditing for them, and these regulatory issues, the, the third party uh, risk that we're, we're seeing with CFI uh, st will start to go away and become more of an auditable code base where you don't actually have to trust someone's proof of reserve. So uh, I'll kick it to you, Robert, now that, now that you're back, I want to ask a different question. And, and thanks, Aaron. Um, we always talk about, and I always ask the question whether decentralization is a good thing. Now we're asking whether centralization is a good thing in the wake of FTX. Um, where do where do we stand right now? Would you rather have, or would you recommend, or would you rather have all your net worth in something like cold storage, 
Um, or would you, or is there still a place for a trusted third party um, like a centralized exchange? Uh, JP Morgan just came out the other day and they said, we're only, we're only institutionals are only going to invest in centralized exchanges and stray away from DeFi for a number of reasons. Um, what's your take on that? Robert. Oh, good. So I like Fireblocks and private wallets and cold storage. So Fireblocks has raised a lot of money and has uh, achieved a, a very good reputa reputation with large institutions for protecting uh, assets uh, offline. And also when they're online, they prevent hacking. So we had over $2 billion worth of hacks this, this year in uh, uh, DeFi. Uh, and yet the market has gone up over 630% because um, of the precautions that most of the uh, institutions in DeFi are taking. So we went uh, total value locked from 1.8 billion to 13 billion, but it's still down from uh, 65 billion last year at the peak. Uh, so I think that um, cybersecurity is a major issue in crypto. Uh, clearly the regulatory environment, uh, we just had a key reversal in credibility of a major institution, FTX, that. Uh, had been the number one source of lobbying money on Capitol Hill. And now, of course, uh, all of the people they met with are chagrined and embarrassed by the fact that they were taking that money. And some of them may have to give it back uh, before they run for re-election again, because it is a source of uh, embarrassment. So you're going to see a regulatory regime that's going to reinforce the 33 Act, the 34 Act, and eventually the, the 40 Act and uh, enforce uh, the Howey test. Uh, so I think that the market will get a si some relief next year in the macro uh, environment because uh, early December next month, we're gonna have a 50 basis point rise very likely is the consensus, followed by 25 basis points in February, 25 in March, 25 in May is the street consensus. So if that results in inflation heading toward 2%, you could see a resurgence of liquidity, not only into uh, broader capital markets, but also into the crypto capital market, which is kind of siloed. You don't see a lot of major financial institutions like Fidelity uh, taking uh, capital mm -hmm. risk. Uh, they're primarily a brokerage firm uh, with regard to uh, the, the major Web 3.0, uh, investors, we had a huge bull run last year with venture capital putting in 25 billion or more into Web 3.0 and blockchain startups. And even this year, uh, as of June, uh, 3.6 billion into Web 3.0. So we have a lot of money coming into the private market, which is not affected by these public uh, token markets. The biggest problem with the token markets is the tokens that were used as collateral and, and that wasn't in, for loans, and that wasn't fully disclosed. They didn't have financial controls. Um, the administrator for, or the current CEO of FTX, as uh, was mentioned earlier, ran uh, the uh, unwinding of uh, the Enron uh, debacle and has a lot of experience and thought this is the worst he's ever seen. So we now have uh, <laughs> terrible branding in the uh, crypto space for institutionalization. And yet we have a huge amount of money coming into the private market that uh, indicates a degree of confidence that we'll have a recovery probably by the third, fourth quarter next year in terms of uh, public sentiment, in terms of private market sentiment, uh, we're gonna see larger deals getting funded. So, so we will have a, a, a halvening Sometime in March of 24, I think is the date that we're gonna have a Bitcoin happening. Typically you see a big rush uh, to speculative uh, interest uh, following the happening and prior to the happening. So we could have a 24, 25 recovery in this whole space, which will be probably much better regulated than it is now. The happening also sounds like a great title for a horror movie, like a slasher flick, um, but uh, <clears throat> Just, just trying to just trying to breathe some levity into the room. Um, so I want to kick it back to kick it back to you, Ron. Just, to, just to to go back around the room. 
Um, you know, I, I've been under the impression that in the crypto space, we've all been part of a giant social experiment, right? Which is to ask the philosophical question, what is anything worth, right? What, what, what do we find value in? Um, and, I, and I feel like this happens very cyclically with every other market where something gets really hot, like Web 1.0, right? Now all, all the investor money rushes into it and they start funding projects that have a lot of flash, but no substance. Um, and then you end up, there ends up being a reset of some sort. You know, we saw it with the dot-com bubble. We're seeing it now. Is, is crypto, is crypto unique in, in, in relative to, let's say like other bubbles that have burst before, or is crypto just another example of, you know, when Silicon Valley see something that they like and they lose its mind, then everyone else begins to lose this mind. And then there are people that end up getting hurt, um, when technology outpaces regulation. It's a, it's a great question, Daniel. Look, there's genuine innovation, but like many things, it gets carried away. You put in a security format, you access liquidity and leverage, and then asset prices run to the moon. So taking a step back here, what we've seen is $9 trillion in quantitative easing over the last 10 years, a multiple of that, like at global central banks. So in that macro backdrop, you've seen the shift from PE ratios to price to sales ratios of 100. You've seen the proliferation of SPACs. You've seen the compression of interest rates. The, the booming of real estate asset prices. That's the common factor driving asset prices. Now we're seeing that in reverse and we're just starting. Only a trillion dollars has run off the Fed balance sheet and they're still raising rates. So you're gonna see crypto asset prices be punished for that, including Bitcoin and ETH. Uh, you can't run against that tide. So where to focus? The best thesis we have as an investor is early stage crypto venture capital, where you get top tier managers that are native, that have a great network, that have valuation discipline. Uh, and that's where we're focused. So my partner, Pete's Cambridge Associates, take that framework, focus on that. I'll be contrarian here. I don't think Bitcoin's the right move. Rarely, if ever, has the trade of the last 10 years been the best trade of the next 10 years. It doesn't happen. Uh, within crypto assets, L1s are good opportunities, but even within L1s, focus on productive assets that generate in-kind dividends and yields. ETH is starting to do that with proof of stake. And back to your question, if you can't wrap a valuation framework or a DCF around the asset, you got to pause and take a step back. You should insist upon that rigor and standard uh, before making an investment. So headline is, look, two years of pain. We were in a crypto winter. We have another winter that started with a loss of confidence. We have yet to see the historical drawdowns on Bitcoin and ETH from historical bear cycles. So expect more pain, preserve capital, focus on early stage venture. Five to seven years from now, the pendulum will swing back to the side. You'll get good returns. Yeah, well, that's good. You 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 added to my to my movie tagline, the happening, expect more pain. Um, <laughs> one, one of one of the things that I always feel like people conflate, right? Like even we get we get all hepped up in these terms of art, right? Where we've thrown out a lot of we've thrown out a lot of acronyms. Um, and you know, we talk even even the word crypto is, is something that's become conflated. Um, when I when I hear the word crypto or web three, I think about just about the blockchain as a technology. Um, and there are good applications, there are bad applications of it, or they, and there's some, there's a lot that are somewhere in the middle. Um, I think this is for the whole group, and I, and I love everyone's opinion on this. I'll start with you, Mark. Um, what, in your view, that you've seen is an actual good and viable application of blockchain technology? Um, and you could feel free to give any bad ones that, that you've seen as well. Uh, Walmart requires its uh, suppliers of its various products to be on its blockchain, a, a, a permissioned blockchain, meaning it's not available to the public so that the provenance of each of its supply products that it gives to all its stores uh, has, you know, is easily, like, easily identifiable. Unlike for those that maybe are too young to know, 30 years ago when people had spiked at aspirin and it took them two weeks to figure out which manufacturing facility at J&J was the one that had the bad aspirin, right, in it. Now it can be done in a matter of a, hours. Uh, real estate transactions. I think all the title insurance companies are going to be a thing of the past in a matter of time. You have in Illinois, Cook County, uh, they did a pilot program. You have it being done in other countries. You have an entity called Sweet in Sweden called Chromaway. They were given money for the inter, inter, interbank, inter, internet, interbank, the international bank, part of the UN, to be able to set up 
uh, blockchain systems for all the registries of all the real estate in those entire countries of Bolivia, Paraguay, and the third country. The country state of Georgia requires all of its real estate transactions to be done on blockchain. Okay. Now, I'm not a big believer like Pat. I'm not won over about NFTs. I think smart contracts, which has been around since the, the thought of it, 20, 1994, was uh, Zabo coming up with the idea uh, uh, is, is going to be the future and it continues to be there. People just have to remember that blockchain is technology, just like the internet was a technology. And if you look at it through that prism, you appreciate its value. I do want to comment, if I very briefly can, about a few things people have said. One is, I do agree that centralized exchanges will be some centralized regulated exchanges, regulated exchanges will be the beneficiaries. Fidelity is opening up its 401ks to, to if they don't end up doing that because of political pressure, that would be a bad thing. But Goldman is doing the same thing. Second thing I want to note, I think get, one could argue that the SEC chairman Gensler uh, has caused part of these problems for us in this space, for those that are believers in the space. Uh, unlike Commissioner Pierce, who I had speak in my class back in April, uh, you know, he, she put forth proposals for safe harbors to allow the development of startups to be able to be semi-regulated, to allow disclosure, to have more just transparency over a three-year period and to raise capital. He's completely rejected it. He won't, he won't even discuss it. There are exemptions that are available under the securities laws that could be utilized for a number of the players in the space. He, he's, he's just verboten in that whole space. I don't think it's gonna be four to five years before we find a control group, as Pat was suggesting for Bitcoin that will allow regulators to adopt it. There is a lawsuit currently by Grayscale where it was trying to convert its uh, uh, trust, the GBTC product that it has publicly now uh, into, a, into an ETF. Uh, that was rejected along with many other ETF possibilities by a number of other applicants by the SEC. My point of view is I don't see any distinction between allowing an ETF for spot-based Bitcoin or futures-based Bitcoin. None. In fact, it costs more from a costs more from a cost basis to run a, a futures-based uh, spot chain. They are now up in the second in the district court uh, uh, in DC. I give that lawsuit a chance of a 40 to 50 percent chance of success. When that happens, GBTC, which is and, and ETH, which are the two products of Grayscale, which are now trading at a 40% discount to the market, will be immediately go back to par. And you'll see, I think, a tremendous growth and potential explosion occurring, uh, both for ETH and, and, and blockchain. The final thing I just want to note is on disintermediation, which I think is very interesting. I and mean, is really what is the cause and, uh, and root of what happened with FTX. And I don't think no one's really talking about this, but it's occurred and no one's paying. It's in front of your face, but you don't see it. Think about it. First of all, it's all mostly foreigners that are gonna be affected by this, okay? Because the US entity, FTX US is solvent and did not file bankruptcy, okay? And that came much, much later. So it's really the foreign entity, which only foreigners were allowed to be in that are gonna be mostly affected by what occurred with FTX. No differently to some degree than in the Madoff case, okay? But what I find most interesting is think about what people would do. They will, you are you're buying you're buying ETH or Bitcoin or some other coin on Coinbase, which is an exchange, or on Gemini, which is an exchange. What the hell happened to the broker dealer? Remember, this used to be our system has been created, and the securities laws have the 33 Act, which is capital raising, but the 34 Act, which regulates broker dealers and exchanges. Now. That fact that Gemini and Coinbase had a bit license is a poor, poor substitute for saying that they were right, that they're fully regulated as an exchange and have all the protections. But it's the broker dealer piece in the middle that's been disintermediated. Satoshi, what he's created worked in a large measure. The disintermediation of unnecessary trusted advisors, arguably, but I disagree, but I think we need it in this space, particularly with exchanges. It was the broker dealer that did the suitability issues. It was the broker dealer that had net capital requirements. It was the broker dealer that limited the amount of margin one could do under Reg T and Reg F. It's the broker dealer that did monthly focus reports for FINRA. It's a, so this protective custom, customer protection group that was there that you would first buy Bitcoin through, you buy a stock through a broker firm that then goes to an exchange. They're just yeah. intermediary. That's what the failure 
in what's occurring here. That's got to be fixed. That does part of the ecosystem does need to be regulated better. And we'll see what happens. If I may build off of Mark's point, I appreciate your point. So they're right on the mark. Where are the broker dealers? So what's happening is FINRA is not approving any broker dealers to offer unregistered securities to the public. So the question is, are these crypto security securities or not? I would say, yes, they are. And we want them to be securities because then I can get cash flow and in-kind dividends. Otherwise, what are we investing in? So that's the issue. The SEC has an opportunity to offer interpretive guidance. They issued guidance three years ago. They haven't done it since then. Uh, we published an op-ed the week before the FTX class, great timing, with the former SEC chair, Arthur Levitt. It does provide a, a forward-looking crypto regulatory framework that does bring crypto within the federal securities framework and would allow broker dealers to offer securities, would allow ATSs to offer broad range securities uh, as well. So there's a path forward. Wow. Um, so uh, I promised to be traffic cop. That was a really good filibuster mark. So I wasn't, I, I assume you had the whole room captivated and it was very passionate. So, uh, but I, I do, I do want to get back on track for one second. So we were talking, we were talking about good applications of blockchain, bad applications of blockchain. I heard a few, I actually heard a call out. So I'll let you respond to that, Pat, because Mark, I'm with you, especially with NFTs. I think largely it's a scam not to be pejorative, but, but the way they've been deployed, largely a scam. Pat, I know you're, you're pro NFT. Let's talk about it. I, well, no, I'm not, I'm not pro NFT. Okay. I put words in your mouth. Yeah. I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm interested in it, but the value it, look, I have friends, actually some groups on the advisory board. And by the way, Mark and Ram, thank you for that, that both of those comments, because that's exactly what we are. We're the broker dealer in this space. Very much appreciated. And we're doing digital security. So, um, you know, I'm a TradFi guy. It, it just, just makes sense. Um, but in terms of NFTs, we actually have some advisory board members with Oasis Pro who were early in CryptoPunks and early in uh, Board Ape Yacht Club. And they made a whole heck of a lot of money because those things went to mil many, many millions. And uh, they couldn't really explain it to me either. So um, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure all that out. Uh, at the end of the day. But, you know, um, as we go through this, uh, someone made this comment to me the other day. And I, uh, you know, you know, when you think about crypto and block, again, blockchain is a different tech, right? That's when I got, um, I, I became very interested in this space because I thought crypto was a scam four years ago and it didn't make any sense to me. But when I separated crypto and blockchain, blockchain tech, as, as Mark said, from a capital markets, trade, finance, supply chain management, et cetera. The blockchain makes a whole heck of a lot of sense and, um, and, and needs to be put in place and it's happening across the board. But there was a quote from a philosopher, Nietzsche, and, and it, it, it's just resonating in my head over the last week or so. And, it's, and those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who couldn't hear the music. So basically, you know, this panel, you know, overall sees the opportunity, the long-term opportunity here. And I think we're all bullish long-term uh, to be defined what long-term is. Uh, but it's very difficult to explain what, in terms of traditional finance techniques. You have to be in the space. You have to uh, see what we're seeing in terms of infrastructure. So again, we focus on institutions. Fidelity's been mentioned. JP Morgan's been mentioned. You know, all the large institutions are very, very quietly building blockchains, some private, some are building smart contracts, some are doing their own tokenization, and they're all prepping for this in terms of digital securities in the future. But they're not seeing the demand mm -hmm. from the institutional investors yet. They are seeing the demand from institutional investors for Bitcoin and ETH. So that's why like Bank of New York Mellon uh, has, has uh, established that for institutions. That's what Fidelity has been doing for the last several years, and then recently announced that they're going to open it up to retail investors. So, so if you're a skeptic on this industry, I would, I would just, you know, since we're in it and we're seeing all this progress occurring, where a year ago, the large institutions would uh, be on a call with us and say, check back with us in three months, whereas now they're reaching out to us. So the dynamics have changed very dramatically. And uh, we're, I'm, frankly, I'm more bullish now, despite the, the winter and or ice age that we're in than I've ever been. 
So for those okay. playing along at home, um, I didn't think a Nietzsche reference would make it onto the bingo card, but if you had it, come and see Marty for your prize. Um, thank you for that, Pat. Aaron, I don't want, I, I don't mean to skip you. I, ju I do, I'm going to, because I'm, I'm pressed for time and I, I want to give, I don't want to give Robert short shrift here. One of the things that we didn't talk about, which is another buzzwordy thing, um, which could be a good application of blockchain. I know something, Robert, you had mentioned before, is the metaverse. Um, so there are a lot of ways to take this. Um, let me just form it in a succinct ish question, which is to say, um, what is the metaverse and, and is that a good application of blockchain technology or not? Robert. Okay. So there's uh, been a bit of a hype cycle, Gartner and other analysts uh, monitoring hype in many fields and the metaverse led by uh, Meta and Microsoft and 10 other firms that are public, uh, they're promoting uh, many applications in the metaverse, one of which is e-commerce, another is tourism, another is virtual uh, world, worlds. Uh, and I think from a social networking, gaming, job training, education point of view, there are real world cases for metaverse that are significant and can generate positive cash flow, one of which is play to earn gaming, which may have peaked uh, this year with Axis Infinity, a metaverse crypto coin, but uh, that was affected by the general downtrend in, in crypto. But Decentraland is engaging in immersive virtual gaming experiences. So there's a huge volume of activity. Uh, and many public companies are now appointing an officer in charge of metaverse, like chief metaverse off officer. So I see, for example, in the tourism space, cruise lines adopting metaverse. Um, I had a one hour conversation with the head of marketing for Virgin uh, Cruises. You know, they have four boats, tiny compared to the other fleets, but, but they're engaging in a process of evaluating the feasibility of getting people to try uh, to go on a half an hour, one hour metaverse tour before they actually pay uh, for the real tour. Can so you, can you get I real norovirus on the metaverse cruise tour or no? Can Pardon? you get real norovirus on the metaverse <laughs> cruise tour or no? <laughs> That's right. A metaverse virus would be good. So, so I think metaverse is the, the projections are, you know, in the trillions of dollars, Asia is going to be the leader apparently. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, segments to this market. E-commerce, I think will be a big segment because people want to try and before they buy and they want to see what it looks like immersively, say, to put on a, a suit, for example, uh, or another garment. So I think that we're going to see a lot of uh, money spent uh, on the metaverse and the, not only venture capital, but public uh, corporate venture as well. Great. Um, and then, Marty, I know I'm pressed for time, so I'll let Aaron address this question. If we have time for anything else, you let me know. But Aaron, give me, give me a good application of blockchain or anything else you want to talk about, considering I made you wait. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think my mine was taken very early, which is the uh, land titles. Uh, I've been a big fan of, of um, real estate being uh, intertwined with blockchain, uh, I believe. The first time I saw that uh, being used was in um, Washington and Wisconsin um, with a uh, at the library library of Alexandria project, which was pretty early in terms of the cycle, I think 2015, 2016, um, which has continued slowly, but uh, other projects have caught on and, and seen that their success and, and continued with that theme um, as well. Obviously the uh, supply chain uh, applications are, are very uh, easy targets for cryptocurrency, but you know I think I want to take the contra uh, the not the contrarian stance the the uh, the normie stance of I think Bitcoin is is the is the application. Um, I, I think we're having the same conversation we had about ten years ago when when we had this uh, Mt. Gox crisis. I'm hearing the same talking points. Um, I'm I'm seeing the same patterns, and I firmly believe we'll see the same pattern in the next three years of, of the uh, fallout from Mt. Gox uh, where people forget about it and we go back to this uh, pristine uh, collateral scenario where people actually value it as pristine collateral. So asking for a friend, are you a buyer at 16,000? Absolutely not. 
Okay. All right. Well, there, I think that I think that says as much as anything. Um, Mar Marty, how are we doing on how are we doing yeah. on time? Yeah, you have time for one more question. Okay. One more one more question. <clears throat> okay. Then let, let me ask let me ask a pandering question for the room, and I'll start with the folks in the room. Um, if, if you're a family office considering getting involved in the Web three crypto space, uh, what is your best bet? And we'll take we'll take it around the room. So we've heard good applications, right? And these these may have the same answers. Me these may have a different answer. Because Marty's allowed me five more minutes, you can feel free to filibuster because I don't feel like it's my fault at this point. So, um, Mark, I'll start with you, Ram, and then we'll kick it around the room. I think the someone either in this panel or the earlier mentioned how equity investments in businesses that are in the blockchain space, whether it's infrastructure or other areas, is a very uh, smart play, I think. But the play, the way to really play, spend, do any kind of investment in the space has to be diversification. That's come the end of the day. You, you, it's a venture capital investment. You buy 30 coins, you buy 30 equity, invest, 10 equity investments, and then four fail, two up, break even, and the other ones, you know, are 50, 150x. Yeah, like I, I agree. Like I think venture capital is the way to go. VCs have a competitive advantage that if you're not a VC, you don't have. And in part, that's driven by securities regulation. In the ICO era, you could raise money from retail. With the enforcement actions, you raise money from VCs, they get in at a low token price, they can flip out of that. Obviously, that trade is done because capital markets are, are crushed right now. But that, that driver still exists within venture capital. The infrastructure plays are the way to go. If you look across fintech in general, the best businesses have been picks and shovels infrastructure play. There's some interesting tokens that folks have mentioned here. I'm a big maker fan as well, just not at these prices. I like ETH, again, just not at these prices. Uh, but I think early stage venture, if you look at some of the best venture funds, they've done 10x back to back returns, even not on the token side. So that's that's where you should focus now. How about we so do I'd like to? Yeah, I was going to kick it to you, Robert. So I was going to go Robert, Aaron, Pat. So uh, Good Block has a product called D Store, and it's in the decentralized storage infrastructure area. So Google uh, Good Block and uh, and D store, D uh, S T O R, and see what they're doing in the decentralized storage infrastructure space. In the uh, uh, in the space of uh, di digitization of uh, deed and title on the blockchain, Google Gov Del Norte space Del Norte Holdings has two contracts in Honduras and uh, El Salvador, and soon in um, in uh, Guatemala, and they're uh, the leader in Latin America in the prop tech space for digitizing property title. So those are two examples of infrastructure. A third, very briefly, is Helium, uh, which signed a deal last October 21st with Dish Networks, a public company. And uh, uh, last August, uh, uh, Andreessen Horowitz invested 110 million, 111 million in Helium for hotspots on the blockchain. Uh, so there's that's three examples, one in 5G, one in uh, prop tech, and one in decentralized storage or in the venture market where uh, you're gonna see uh, many milestones in, in all three of those examples. All right, Aaron, Aaron, then Pat, and Pat, I'm expecting either a Kant or, uh, or, or some other philosopher's quote before we leave it. Uh, Aaron, go ahead. I'll let Pat go first. I, I, I have to think about a little bit more. Okay. Um, well, I'll be sure. I don't have a, another quote except "Go USA," and uh, in a, in about twenty minutes. But um, infrastructure, and, and that's a bit self-serving because we're a fintech infrastructure company. But definitely believe in infrastructure. You know, I've already already mentioned Bitcoin and ETH. I'm not a buyer at these levels either. Um, but um, but that's that's what I that's what my personal focus is uh, going forward over the next two to five years. Aaron, do you have enough time? Yeah, um, I, I definitely would agree with Pat. The, the infrastructure around uh, cryptocurrency and, and their exchanges are is probably the most important uh, aspect to me. The What I had mentioned before as the this sort of dichotomy between DEXs and centralized exchanges uh, really needs to play out. I, I don't have answers of how it will play out. I have pretty good guesses. Um, but I think as we get more surety on, on CFI, uh, DeFi will have to increase its, its security because it's going to, going to want to compete. 
So it's going to be a healthy competition. I, I believe this will be positive for the space. All right. Well, I think, I think with that, um, I think what's useful, actually, but first of all, thank you, everybody. I tried to manage this as best as possible. Thank you, Marty, for letting me do it. Um, for the remote folks, I actually found something that's really useful. So if you just want to, if anyone that wants to follow up, throw your uh, contact info in the chat and